So uh, the, the topic I'm supposed to speak about um, is not as directly concerned with uh, um, companies as uh, the one that my co-citizen, uh, uh, Mr. Jopis, will speak later, which is directly related to that. This is a, on the sides, and it is to what extent insolvency and the European insolvency um, legal instruments and draft instruments affect and are able to affect law the law of corporations, the practice of corporations, and um, no less, corporate governance and decision-making processes. Um, so um, I will try to, to go over some of the main elements. I might have to, uh, because I wasn't sure what type of public I would be speaking to, I, I might say things that are very evident to you, and uh, if that is the case, I sincerely apologize. I will try to, uh, if I see that's the case, I will just fly over them. Um, so the idea for, I will start by, uh, so what, what I did is ask myself, how does, insolv from a European perspective, how does insolvency law affect corporate law? And um, one of the things that uh, came first to my mind uh, is um, the different levels of integration. And here I will draw some of the thoughts that comes from my experience that uh, Professor Cognac so kindly uh, expressed in my introduction which is the world in developing nations with the bank with the world bank by the way since the world bank reference is in my signature i must say as always that nothing i say has anything to to do with the world bank this is not even has to do with my university it's my own personal opinion and no one else's um, so unlike corporate law which uh, as you all know has a very high degree of integration and harmonization within the european union um, things are very different in insolvency law. It is and has always been, not only here but everywhere, very difficult to achieve substantive harmonization of insolvency law. And you might wonder why. Why is that the case? Why can we harmonize corporate law and it's so difficult to harmonize insolvency law? There are a number of reasons for it. First of all, perhaps the most romantic one, but also with, which bears strong practical consequences, the truth is, insolvency law is the realm of sentiment and is the realm of values of a, of a, of a country. If a country decides to provide a priority to um, uh, employees, um, as opposed to providing a priority to financial institutions in their credit, it is taking a policy decision based on the values of that society in particular. So, when you, uh, when the bank or the IMF or any international financial institution goes to a country and says, well, there are some, there's some design of insolvency law which is clearly accepted worldwide as the best solution, when we come to priorities, that's something that you have to stop, take a step back and say, well, this affects values and the core decisions of a legislator and therefore who are we to say that it's better to pay banks ahead of employees or the other way around? So, because it affects values, it's very difficult to harmonize because the values of societies are not harmonized themselves. So, this is uh, one of the uh, main elements. A lot could be said about this, because what would seem on the face of it a choose of value sometimes is not so much the case. But um, that is one of the main reasons, just countries refuse to harmonize this. Most, most often, the reason why legislators refuse to harmonize insolvency laws is because they don't want to give up on their tax priority. And uh, this is, at this stage, worldwide recognized as a mistake. But still, they continue to enforce this difference. Um, in a, uh, now, if we constrain ourselves more to Europe, the truth is that um, we have, especially those of us who live in countries that belong to the Eurozone, we have given up so much of our um, uh, economic policy sovereignty, that insolvency law, which is very much direct, uh, linked and, and, and influenced uh, by economic policy and is capable of influence in economic policy, is one of the last niches of, uh, of, of uh, statehood. This is one of the last niches in which each country can enforce its own uh, economic policy decisions. And countries are reluctant to give that up too. So that's another reason. And the third reason, no less important, and I would think very, very important in many of the changes that, you, that the Commission is considering, is the reluctance of lobbies, very powerful lobbies, 
that dig the heels when it comes to changing and unifying laws that might perhaps undermine their privileged situation in their own country. Uh, so these are one, some of the reasons why um, insolvency law is, um, dif is a difficult part of the law to harmonize. Uh, because it, this also explains the approach taken by our authorities in the European Union until very recently, and I'll speak about this later. Um, all we had was a rule that solves conflicts and it creates coordination rules. So if there is a, an insolvency with cross-border elements, we will just aim for a solution to ensure that there is a proper adequate efficient coordination and we will say or we will predetermine which law applies but there is no substantive unification of the rules or there was not since the very beginning we've had many directives on corporate law we are still struggling big time to carry forward a directive on out of court restructuring for insolvency the opposition of some governments because I'm represent and not part of the European Commission group, I can say the opposition of Germany is massive to the approval of this directive. So we will see where this, how far this, this goes. Uh, in any case, it's, um, it's uh, noticeable indeed that uh, there are three ways through which harmonization in insolvency law is, is slowly uh, kicking in. Uh, one of them is um, you might not be so aware of this, the work of international financial institutions um, following uh, or as a consequence of their intervention in European countries after the uh, 2008 finan global financial crisis. Most of our countries have been visited by the International Monetary Fund and uh, the International Monetary Fund's lending decisions are to a certain extent linked with the proper market design, and in their opinion, a proper market design requires proper insolvency laws. So there is a process of harmonization to a certain extent, because the IMF, you want the IMF money, uh, is behind it. Uh, the IMF, the, which doesn't work alone here, works hand in hand with the European Commission, the famous Troika. So in the background, in a somehow hidden manner, harmonization is taking place via um, post-crisis uh, uh, reform. Uh, then we started the European Commission boldly and very nicely, in my opinion, started with the, the recommendation in 2014, which ga gave place to um, the um, um, proposal directive of uh, November 2016 on out of court, on restructuring and second chance, which is uh, a fantastic piece of, uh, um, of work but, uh, of course, subject to improvement, like every uh, compromise text, but, um, which is, as I said, struggling to get in, but it's st still there and it's triggering a lot of debate, which is very good. And third, the uh, deepest harmonization concerns my uh, dear friend Conchetta Brescia Mora's intervention later, which is uh, bank recovery and resolution um, framework of the United, or sorry, the European Union. So why is... Uh, why is harmonization easier in corporate law? Why has uh, substantive harmonization taken place much deeper in corporate law? Uh, th there might be a number of reasons. I'm just listing some of them. For example, one of them is um, the... Uh, sorry, let me repose the question. Why is forum shopping choosing the right framework or trying to contract out of the regulation that you would naturally be assigned something that is not really so much a problem in, insolven in corporate law as it is uh, practice says in insolvency law. Uh, first, higher harmonization of uh, corporate law. Second, and no, no less important, because most of the decisions as to where to incorporate a business and avail yourself of the um, law that will be applicable to the place of incorporation, take place ex ante. So you want to start a business and you decide where you want that business to be incorporated. Of course, um, there has been some forum shopping, if you will, if you want to, to mention that here, um, towards the UK. You know, many German companies have been set up in the UK, even though they operate not in the UK. 
that is going to, uh, end, to, to end very soon. Those are going to have a real problem, uh, especially if you apply the real seat <laughs> and the consequences of not having uh, a real seat in, the United, in, in, in Germany. So, but anyway, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, it's it's ex an ex-ante decision and it's much more controllable and it affects less stakeholders. Um, and when there are, where there are exposed amendments, where exposed the company decides to move somewhere else, the directives offer very strong protections to the stakeholders involved, perhaps even too hard on some uh, topics. Uh, if you look at directive on cross-border mergers, the protection of shareholders and some creditors is very, is so strong that on the verge of financial crisis, which is the, the moment in which many con companies dis dis decide to move makes it impossible. Uh, so, but uh, anyway, uh, we will revisit this if I have the time. Um, so, but however, the, this, this change of uh, or cherry picking of the system where you want uh, to go is much more problematic and has proved much more problematic in European practice concerning insolvency and pre-insolvency systems. Um, we all have heard about the um, famous uh, bankruptcy tourism expression, which sounds a bit odd, but uh, it exists, people who just cherry pick individuals even. And we are all aware of the famous uh, vanity problem that the uh, flee to the United King Kingdom to, of big companies to use schemes of arrangement has created in most of our countries, because it is in a way a vanity problem, uh, in my opinion. But, um, the, the, the thing is, when a company who is in financial distress or about to be in financial distress decides to go somewhere else uh, and change the company activities and, and its restructuring activities, um, it is not choosing, it's, not about, it's an exposed activity, it's not about choosing where to be born, it's about choosing where to go to hospital to prevent dying or to die. It's a different choice and of course, if you are not born, your parents make a decision for you, it's all right. If you've been living for a long time, you have a lot of relationships with people, you have family, you have friends, you have creditors, and if you have to, if you exposed want to change the, the rules of the game, all those in between are deeply affected. So it's not as easy, it's more difficult to change exposed, and therefore sufficient and adequate protection mechanisms need to be envisaged to protect um, um, those stakeholders that require protection. So this is not such an easy thing and it needs careful debate and careful r rules. Uh, I will from now on tell you that I am personally in favor of forum shopping. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing if you look at the European insolvency regulation of 2000, it was, forum shopping was like naming the devil. You just wouldn't do it. Everything was supposed to be to avoid forum shopping. All the decisions of the early decisions of the European Court of Justice said, well, this is all about avoiding forum shopping as if forum shopping was uh, dropping an, a bomb somewhere. Uh, nowadays, things have changed. And forum shopping might make sense, at least in some circumstances, might be good for the parties. So we have to revisit and reconsider these elements and make sure that the forum shopping that's allowed is a forum shopping that adds value and doesn't destroy the value. So. Uh, let, let's see how this is treated in the uh, applicable regulation, which is the European regulation of, which in, was um, uh, passed in 2015, which um, came into force last summer, and uh, which is summarized in a summarized manner called uh, the recast of the regulation. But before that, allow me a, a small indulgement. I don't know if I'm overstepping Paco's presentation later a bit on this, uh, uh, but uh, the, what lies under all of these reflections and, and whether we should allow for forum shopping or not, in a way, it's the debate between what's better, harmonization or regulatory competition, which is a classic, um, it's a classic academic and practical debate that took place in the United States concerning uh, corporate law. Uh, of course, there are, there are people that support 
uh, regulatory competition strongly, they say you should let companies move and insolvency in this case. People, you should let people go and choose the hospital wherever they want to go to die or heal. Uh, you should not interfere with that. And others say, no, we should harmonize because if you harmonize, there is no benefit in changing, at least on the face of it. So that is, uh, this different approach is indeed very nice for vanity purposes. And I wonder if some vanity was behind the adoption of the directive because, uh, well, uh, a Spaniard or a, a German or a French proud people say, why are my companies going to England? I don't like that. Well, perhaps a way to avoid Spanish companies going to England is to replicate the English system in Spain. Why go to England then? That might be part of the deal, although, as we will see, unfortunately, it's not that easy because the, way, the reason why people go to England is because their judges and their lawyers are better, at least in the, in the big companies, I'm afraid. Uh, that they they are, want to benefit from the more experienced market. It's not that they are better personally, it's that they are more experienced and they, are, uh, they know how to deal with, with these things. Um, so. Um, so let me skip this because we don't have time. The, the, the recast and the corporate law, um, a very brief overview of how we reached the current state of the um, criterion to assign jurisdiction and to a good extent applicable law in the uh, insolvency um, recast. Um, you, you all know that the jurisdiction is assigned based on the famous Comey uh, center of main interests. Center of Main Interest is a creation of a brilliant German called Manfred Balz, who uh, was assisting the Ministry of Justice then, and who is behind many things, many more things than people know. He is the author, basically, of the German insolvency law. He is the author of all the privatization of Eastern Germany. Uh, this, this very clever man, as clever as unknown to the general public, was the one who define this concept and we will go into the economic rationale when we challenge this, this, this concept. So the, the Comey is very sim is similar or very similar to the real seat uh, idea in the sense that it links the jurisdiction to a certain extent to the material reality of the activity of the business. It's not just saying I want to um, uh, go and, and use the hospital when I'm when I'm uh, distressed or ill in the UK, but I will be active in France. It has to be, in or, there is a presumption, of course, but in order to have the Comey in the UK, you have to have some uh, material activity there, otherwise it just won't work, uh, or at least it shouldn't work. So, um, as you know, the Comey is a concept that's based on uh, uh, where the, it's, it's more or less, apologies, I'm not very good with uh, um, uh, verbat verbatim uh, definitions, uh, where the business conducts or the, or the entity conducts its business on a regular basis and is ascertainable by third parties. That would be the idea. Um, uh, so uh, it is the appearance for third parties of where the business is conducted that matters to that effect. And why is that what matters? It makes economic sense to it. Because if I am someone who wants to invest, lend or invest in a business, my investment and my lending to this business uh, implies a risk assessment. And the risk assessment, among other elements, will have to take into consideration where this company will be liquidated or will uh, be reorganized in case of financial distress ensues. And, uh, um, so what is relevant is what I, as a prospective investor or lender, uh, would have thought objectively that the um, ma main place of business is, and therefore where I would have to go in case of insolvency. So it's allowing the market to take ex ante sound objective risk assessments. That's the idea. It's very simple. Because it's this simple idea which lies under the concept of Comey is the origin of Comey, it, it's difficult to see how we are, how, how this is ignored when it comes to 
really understanding that the commis switch has taken place by simply sending letters to creditors saying that the commis is somewhere else. But we will uh, debate about this later if I have time. Um, so um, what, what happened with the initial commi? You all know uh, another vanity problem. Uh, we have so many vanity, vanity problems in Europe. Another vanity problem, the English court said, you know, the commi basically is always in the UK. And uh, a, a very famous German professor from the Max Planck said, this is insolvenz imperialismus. And uh, the answer to that was a German courts taking their procedures to their own courts doing exactly the same that the English had done before, let alone the French, which started doing the same, and so on and so forth. So it was a race to uh, their nat uh, national, national jurisdictions uh, and the main underlying principle of the insolvency regulation, which is the principle of mutual trust, was severely undermined from the very beginning. We don't think it's the same having insolvency here. In other words, when a European, at the beginning at least, when a European judge would face a petition for insolvency, he would not say, let me look at the facts and see if your, your commie is actually here. He would say, your commie is actually here, and let me look at the facts that I, allow me to justify that the commie is here. And you can see that because the list of elements that allow, uh, that, 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 that judges use to justify the commie are funny. Some of them are, you know, the nationality of the directors, the language they speak, and things of the, of, of the sort, which um, have very little to do with, uh, in my opinion, with what third parties, creditors, and other stakeholders would have thought uh, was the place of, uh, um, of, the, of the center of main interests. Um, so um, there was this big problem at the end. The concept of Comey was presumptions were reversed, especially in the case of um, uh, enterprise groups. Uh, basically, there was a moment in which wherever the mother company was, the Comey of all the entities was also, and uh, this was not really in accordance with the directive, sorry, with the regulation. So um, at, at, some, at some happy moment, all of this reached the Euro European Court of Justice that put things in order, and in the seminal cases and decisions of Eurofood that everyone knows, and Interedil, uh, the main elements of, um, among others, but those mainly, uh, the main elements of Comey were set finally. What has the recast done with this? It has taken the legacy of the court decisions and incorporated them onto the uh, regulation. Therefore, uh, it has uh, given the strength of the law of a regulation directly applicable in every country um, to what were the most reasonable and sound um, um, interpretations of the previous regulation by European courts and basically by the European Court of Justice. So, who are third parties now? Those whose ascertainability must be uh, assessed, creditors. Um, you need to take to know where the comi is. You need to um, take into consideration all relevant elements. Um, the concept of central administration is incorporated. Sim concept, concept of central administration is very similar to the concept of headquarters, very similar to the nerve center of the United States. This, the concept that the Supreme Court of the United States used to decide where. Uh, what the applicable law is in a corp law of corporations in the United States. Um, so um, all of this has been said. Um, and uh, another um, element is that we don't have time to go over. So um, there have been some criticisms to Comey. And one of the authors of this criticism has been one of the most severe uh, uh, um, critics of uh, the directive as well. Um, uh, is a German professor who works in England. Uh, he, he, he wrote the Comey is a mistaken concept, basically. It would make much more sense to move away from it and simply create, as the only mechanism to assign jurisdiction, the uh, place of incorporation or the domicile. The idea would be this is predictable, and if you need to change things, you can always you, you, you change things based on the law, on corporate law, and uh, basically the directive on cross-border uh, mergers. Um, fortunately, the uh, European Commission didn't really listen to this opinion. Uh, uh, many of us think that the Comey has its flaws, but it is 
a, an excellent criterion and uh, it has worked relatively well uh, amongst all the uh, European legal instruments. I think this is one of the work of the, the ones that's been most refined, has worked best in practice. Uh, if we moved away from Comey, uh, we would be departing from international best practice. Comey is also used by the ancestral model law, is used by every country that has the ancestral model law, the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, and many other countries. So there is a good practical experience, went from bad to better, which is the way things should go. Um, and uh, we are doing the same other countries are doing, which is good. We should not undermine the importance of doing the same things that are globally being done because that creates predictability and it lowers transaction costs and it makes the world easier for business and therefore for uh, markets to grow and thrive. We don't want to depart from a rule that's used in the United States, in Canada, in uh, Australia and in Singapore just because we did have at the beginning some problems. I think Comey is um, tightened enough in its definition um, to support it. Um, plus, if you, if, if you take the place of incorporation as the uh, only mechanism uh, to assign jurisdiction and to some extent applicable law, you are tying the hand, you're handcuffing the, uh, the, debt, the, debt, the debt or the, the possibility of good forum shopping disappears basically because the um, protection of stakeholders in those cases are just too strong in corporate law. And therefore, at least in my opinion, Comey is a good thing. Um, um, one more reflection about bad versus good forum shopping, uh, which uh, interesting that there is an express recognition for the first time of the existence of good forum shopping in the recast itself recital 29. What was the devil now has become sometimes the devil, sometimes an angel. And the challenge is to identify when we are before Jenkel or when we are before Mr. Hyde. Uh, that's the idea. Um, so what, when are we before good forum shopping? When are we before bad forum shopping? And uh, the easy answer, which is easier said than done, um, is to say, well, what are the reasons for the Comey? And if the reasons for the change of the Comey um, are related to or, or generate um, an enhancement, it generates an, an increase in the value of the firm or in the chances of return to creditors, then we should allow it. And if they don't, if, if the change of Comey is used inadequately by those that have the power to change the, the um, domicile of the business, um, probably hand in hand with some creditor, uh, for reasons that are not to the improvement of the position of creditors, then we should avoid it. And th some examples of those would be um, to redistribute uh, differently the assets as initially envisaged, because that changed the rules of the game exposed and this is not adequate or second in the case where for example directors try to look for a jurisdiction that is more lenient on their misbehavior um, in case of insolvency which has happened in some cases or at least they try to do it um, so um, this is uh, what should be avoided we just have to be wary of the risks and make sure that Good form shopping is allowed and bad form shopping isn't. Um, there is one thing about the pre-insolvency entitlements and, and, and the treatment of, of, of uh, liabilities in insolvency. Some, some debtors might be um, trying to change to benefit some creditors at the expense of others by changing the Comey. Uh, this could happen, but let's not forget that our very well designed recast and previously European regulation creates a very good mechanism to prevent this from happening. And it is secondary proceedings. Uh, people hate secondary proceedings for a, a reason that I don't understand. I think they are very, very good. It's true that they can be a bit, a bit cumbersome and this synthetic uh, 
exper experiment that has been created might make sense. But um, the good thing about op of open secondary proceedings is that you might change the headquarters to United Kingdom or to the Netherlands, but if you had the uh, Comey first in Spain, registered office in Spain, and the factories in Spain, the applicable law to employment contracts is going to be the law, the, the law of Spain. In other words, non-adjusting creditors will be protected by this secondary proceedings uh, conflict of law rule, or at least to a certain extent. In other words, the, the forum shopping is not only uh, difficult to, or it, it can lead to uh, problems, but non-adjusting creditors and main stakeholders are already protected by all the mechanisms of the, of the regulation, and we needn't worry that much, I think. Um, having said this, um, and I will pose, a it's a good thing for a debate here, um, let, 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 let's think about how these commie changes have taken place in large entities in the um, EU. And uh, the way this has been done, basically, is, uh, let's say, a Spanish company um, in Spain who wants to move to the United Kingdom to go to hospital there, and um, they hire um, a famous English law firm in Spain, and what the English law firm practice does is cir circulates uh, um, letters to creditors saying, we've moved, we're moving to the United Kingdom, our new Comey is in the United Kingdom. Uh, but almost certainly that can just be it. Because what matters, as we said before, following Manfred Balz's thinking, is what creditors would have objectively thought the Comey was, where they would have thought the Comey was, at the moment they invested, at the moment they gave credit. That's the whole point. So if you change it now, you can notify me, but this is a fait accompli. This is to no avail to me. Um, so it's not enough. So unless and until at least half of creditors, uh, of the new creditors in the new place, think and know that the Comey is in the new place, the weight's on the other side. And Comey can't be deemed to have changed. Of course, this makes Comey changes very difficult unless we take sides on the next question, which is the main debate, which is what if creditors who thought the Comey was in Spain are happy with the switch of the Comey to the United Kingdom? In other words, can they consent? If they consent exposed, is that enough to understand that they have actually passed the Comey test? That question is not that easy. Um, so, um, probably a good answer to this, and this is just a possibility and food for thought for all of you, is, well, that should be enough in so far as it is clear and objectively demonstrable that the change of the Comey maximizes value, enhances the chances of viability or recovery to creditors, and uh, there is some sort of objective test that protects minority creditors or old creditors, if you will. For example, the best interest test that says you can never get, um, you can never be given less in uh, reorganization than you, you would get in a liquidation in your original place of incorporation. This is just for you to consider. Uh, and we can't forget, and I'll finish with this forum shopping thing, uh, we can't forget that we have to factor in the um, element of uh, the institutional framework. All of this maximization of value, most often, is not related to the law, it's related to the institutions. And people go to the UK because they work better. And until we change that in the, in the, in the EU, and our systems start working as well as they do in the UK, they will continue to go there. That's just as simple as that. If you file for an uh, in-court procedure, or if you will, even a hybrid out-of-court procedure, in a country, in Europe, where you're going to be stranded in court one way or another for months, if not years, I don't, I don't want that. You can have the best law you want, you die. There's no breathing space in court, everyone knows that. Businesses just die. So we need to do something to tackle the institutional problem. Let's, it's very nice to change the laws, but what you need to do is to improve our institutions. That is the key. And I, that has been by far and large 
the biggest challenge in my World Bank wor work over the years, and uh, I don't think it's any different here. Of course, it's a different level of uh, mismanagement of um, institutions here than there is in the developing na nations, but still, what lies under is very similar. Do I still have some few minutes or not? Two minutes? A few, few minutes, okay. Uh, so, uh, right, for, let's forget about groups. Uh, let me talk a bit about the directive proposal, which I so, so very much like, um, and uh, who's all, um, the expert group. Uh, so anything I say wrong about this has nothing to do with uh, it being bad. So basically, every author of it has been is a good friend of mine, so uh, with the exception of Paco, of course, uh, that, uh, but it's, it is perhaps subject to improvement. Let, let me tell you a few words about this directive proposal, which I hope at some stage will be approved. Um, first of all, it's out of court. It's for out of court and hybrid procedures. But that doesn't really mean that it's just that it will not influence in court proceedings. It will influence in court proceedings drastically. Because if you create different effects on creditors. If you create different majorities to approve a plan, you are creating different incentives uh, to opt in. That, that would be a real forum shopping from in court and out of court. And that is not good. We have seen this in Spain, for example, where out of court proceedings had different majorities, higher thresholds to approve plan than the ones you would get inside, and therefore no one was using it. People would just prefer to go in because it was easier to pass a plan, even though they knew coming into court means basically a most certain death, almost as certain as the death of a bull in a bullfighting ring. Uh, you know, some bullfight, some, in some bullfights, bulls are saved. It's one out of 10,000, I think. <coughs> um, so, um, was this directive a way to avoid forum shopping? Uh, by harmonizing law, people will need to go. Um, maybe, but if that was the case, and I will repeat what you said, how do we deal with the institutional disparity? That will not work unless we improve our institutional side. Um, and perhaps the biggest criticism on my side to, um, to the overall or overarching, um, to the overview of the um, of the directive proposal is that it is, despite what it says, what it does is ignore pretty much small and medium enterprises. And uh, uh, Simona said before, the majority of companies are SMEs, not the majority, 98% of the companies. It's such an understatement. It's 98% of the, of the businesses in Europe are SMEs, including micro businesses including individual entrepreneurs, sole proprietors. So we are creating a good piece of work, with very good ideas, for the 2%. So we, maybe we should rescue this um, 99 versus 1% that's used in the United States to protest against Wall Street, because we seem to be focusing always on um, this 1% or 2%, uh, which is probably not a good idea. Um, for example, I know, of course, that it's much, much easier to create another framework to re restructure a corporate and a corporate group with sophisticated people and large entities. But what happens with the smaller businesses? Uh, and uh, smaller, the smaller businesses face the same problems before insolvency and before financial distress. And one of the main problems, for example, is passivity of financial lenders. They just don't care. They can't be bothered. Is too small. So there are, there are mechanisms and ways to include rules out of court and also in court to ensure that at least creditors take the bother of having a look at their portfolio of distressed entities and rescue viable businesses. Because to complement what was said also before by, by Simona, this is not really about a second chance to everyone. This is only a second chance to viable businesses. This is about restructuring viable businesses. Unviable businesses need to go. So they liberate the assets and they can be allocated to more efficient purposes. Liquidation is not bad. It's good if the business that we are liquidating was useless. So what we have to do is identify the correct 
business and some of them will be liquidated and some of them will be rescued. That's the idea to make sure to, to identify them, of course, is the most difficult part. Uh, and, um, uh, and I just have one more shot, one more minute. Um, what, what I want to say, um, I will just concentrate then on uh, one of the things that most directly affects corporate law in the directive proposal, which is everything that concerns the treatment of shareholders uh, and, and directors. Um, for example, the directive includes a very strict absolute priority rule. Shareholders that are deemed to be underwater, even though very rightly shareholders like they do in the United States, are treated as creditors in the sense that they are they are, treated, they are allowed to be a class in the voting of the plan, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, but whenever they are underwater, meaning that the, um, um, the value of the, of the, on, the ongoing value of the business uh, doesn't reach enough to pay all creditors, therefore they are out, they will never get anything, um, um, they, are, uh, they have no say and they can be imposed pretty much every measure. Um, the thing with these is, of course, this is not as tragic as it sounds because the truth is, if you have sophisticated enough negotiators, the banks and creditors, if the shareholders make sense and they are part, an important part of the business, they will incorporate into the solution because it's in their own interest. But they don't have to. The problem with the way directive is so strictly being applied or being has been designed so strictly in terms of absolute priority rule, is that um, don't forget there is no, the, the test to access these measures is only likelihood of insolvency. You don't even have to insolvent to brush away shareholders in uh, one of these proceedings. Um, and um, insolvency here, likelihood of insolvency, is not. Um, I mean, I don't know how it's defined because it doesn't say to, to the best of my understanding, but it's not about balance sheet insolvency, it's about, sorry, it's about balance sheet insolvency, it's not about cash flow insolvency. So uh, you can be cash flow insolvent, but still be balance sheet solvent, that happens sometimes, and swipe out shareholders to a certain extent you're expropriating their position. So this needs to be perhaps made a bit more flexible. Um, and uh, one final point, and I promise to finish, the directive seem, proposal seems to take a step in favor of uh, wrongful trading provisions uh, ahead of uh, duty to file system, um, following closely the recent decisions of Ancestral Working Group 5 on insolvency, which signals best practice in the world. I can only say that that might ma make sense, might make sense, in very developed countries makes very little sense in uh, countries with unsophisticated judicial systems where there is little financial information and where a judge exposed simply does not have the means to look back and analyze with sufficient information what the behavior of the directors was. So in those cases you need a clear-cut rule to see if the director misbehaved or not. If you have to assess all things considered then you have a problem. Even in the country that created wrongful trading, which is the most sophisticated insolvency um, forum in Europe, which is the United Kingdom, wrongful trading is hardly ever used. It's very little used, very little used, to my understanding at least. We can, I can be, I'll stand corrected happily, but that's what I, my understanding is that it's not really used very much. Of course, that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It works ex ante as a, as a deterring, but, but it, in practice, it's very little use. And, 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 uh, and that's it. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat>